Hang on one second. So it doesn't repeat. So that fine. Go. We're going live on Facebook. All right, let's get it, Facebook. <laughs> let's get it. Let's get it. Okay. As soon as I can. Got it. <sighs> And then Helica is not on Facebook. She's on. Oh, uh, she yeah, she's not on Facebook. Okay, I hope it's working. Let me see. Come on now. Okay, we are good. All right. All right. All right. Hey, girl. Hey. hey oh, what's up? What's <laughs> up? It's the Hey, Girl, Hey podcast. Shouts to Urban Media today. I am your radio chick, Kiki Brown. I am your millennial chick, Jer, Jer. Jer, Jer. <laughs> I believe our chatter chick will be checking in. And then we have a special guest, Dr. Angelica Perez Johnston. Of she is CCAC's uh, newest chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. And so she's going to talk to us about what she does, um, mm -hmm. why this position is so important. And I believe she's like the first Hispanic woman to hold this position um, over at CCAC. But we're going to we're going to talk to her. She's also my soror. And so, you know, we got that vibe going on. And then we're going to talk about, you know, the, the issues that's going on in Haiti, the Haiti migrants, all the trending hashtags, and me so white, uh, missing white girl syndrome, Black Lives Matter, of course, the lack of trust for the COVID vaccine, inadequate education, so many other issues that are happening uh, in our community. So before they check in, we're going to we're going to touch on hot topics. You ready? You ready? Jeer, jeer. Ready. I've been all ready. Right. We had a lot of celebrity deaths happening this, this week, within the past two weeks, actually. We had Michael K. Williams from The Wire. Um, he's done so many other um, films, but mostly known as Omar on The Wire. Greg Leakes, Nene Leakes' husband from Real Housewives of Atlanta. Mario Van Peebles died. Um, he was, what, 89 years old. Uh, he was a, a pioneer uh, in Black film and a director. And I I most, I don't know if you know who Mario Van Peoples is, but I remember him from Girlfriends. And he, do you watch Girlfriends? I vaguely watched that show. I, so I vaguely. Tracy Ellis Ross's character dated him. Hey, Chatter Chick. Chatter! dated him and she was like real self-conscious about dating him because he was so old okay. and I remember they had a scene of him they had they were intimate and and they had a scene with him getting up out of the bed butt naked and he had like this old body and she was like <laughs> oh <laughs> we're talking about Mario Van Peebles and I remember him being on an episode of on Girlfriends when um Joan dated that older much older man like he was flirting with her and she was just a smitten and he was so old but he knew what to, you know he knew what to do so we're talking about um the celebrity deaths the chatter chick is now checked in so we yeah. appreciate you lady um Norm McDonald who's a comedian and SNL alum he passed away uh, I was hurt by this. Willie Garson, um, who plays Stanford from Sex and the City. I was yeah. like, oh, Stanford. I know. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's and uh, he played LaBelle a gay Singer. character. He wasn't even gay. He wasn't even gay. Yep. And he um, said, yeah, I was, I, yeah. I, I, he played it so well. Right. I was like, oh, and he was he was a straight guy, but he says as an actor, no one ever asked when he plays an FBI, was he really an FBI? He <laughs> says he's an actor. <laughs> he was really good. He was like, if I were looking for a gay male friend, he would have to be on a Stanford level. Because mm -hmm. he was he was Carrie's best friend, and that was her, you know, she was his Judy. And so that was. The relationship that they had and they did everything together so mm -hmm. I, I i i heard that one that one kind of hurt um and sarah dash from labelle um the labelles 
um yeah the labelle yeah right itchy, kitchy, yeah, yeah, gaga. right right she passed mm-hmm. away uh this week uh, also a tremendous loss actor aj johnson probably know him as Ezel from Friday. Yeah. I watched him on Deaf Comedy Jam and um, Players Club. And, Players Club, yeah. And, uh, but he he died suddenly. The cause of death, of course, has not been released. But the, the, the story behind his, his tragic loss was his wife um, created an, a GoFundMe page um, to help mm-hmm. raise money for the funeral. Mm-hmm. And folks were like, mm-hmm. He had no money. I ain't surprised. And she raised eight hundred dollars, and she was saying, you know, she she put folks on blast about the fake love that the family had been receiving um, oh, after yeah. his death. And so Michael Blackson shared the post, saying, you know, we got to do something, you know, for him. And and um, so the the goal of the GoFundMe was like twenty thousand altogether, and then they raised about forty seven thousand um, dollars. Comedian Lil Rel donated four thousand dollars. He donated the bulk of of the money. So, oh, bro, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I guess yeah. the focus is here. We are with another death and another no insurance and no insurance. insurance I can't and- talk. I keep. I, I gotta fix it. But you know, I don't. I don't know what it because life insurance is like the cheapest insurance. Yes, it yeah. is. It is. It's like five dollars every two years. For fifty thousand dollars, just you can do thirty five dollars a month, and and have your casket and everything, insurance, insurance. I, I hate when people get mad because people don't donate to a GoFundMe page. Like, get your affairs straight. He, mm-hmm. that's pretty selfish not to have your affairs straight. Why? Because people think oh, I'll be dead. I'll leave it on to somebody else. That's selfish. Take care mm-hmm. of your business. So that no one else has to do it for you. They're suffering. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. I have to do that. I don't, yeah. I don't want that's, no GoFundMe page. Mm-mm. I, no. 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 That's when I was a kid. Uh, when it passed, and it took a while for us to have a funeral for him because no one had. There was no money. You know, like there was. He had. I don't think he had any insur- life insurance or anything. So the family was helping pitching money in, you know. Um, but like you said, LaShawn, like that's a very selfish thing, you know, very to put tough. that hurt on one, you know, because it's like, what are we going to do? You know what I mean? We have to bury you. Like, you know, we want to have something for you, but we don't have the money and we're going to leave it up to this person, that person. It shouldn't be that like that at all. I remember a long time mm-hmm. ago before I like, started working and stuff, I was asking, you know, my parents, like, do I got life insurance? You know, because I didn't know. You know, if anything mm-hmm. was to happen to me, can y'all bury me? And my dad was like, "You ain't got to worry about that. They take the money out my check for y'all and all sort of stuff like that." But it's important in thinking about relationship wise. You know, when you get married and stuff, that plan that you're going to have with your husband or your wife, like, hey, if something was to happen, do we have the money? Like, who's gonna? take care right. of this that what about our kids so that's right. something very important to look at whenever you are with someone whenever you're marrying someone like that. yeah that that's it okay 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 i got it oh uh, yeah yeah get get your insurance because you know what kiki i ain't putting no five dollars on on that you know just don't I mean? make me no t-shirts <laughs> all right yeah, I, I I'm not a fan of t-shirts. I'm not a fan of the the flowers on the pole. On the pole, I'm not a fan of those because, especially at the place of my demise, don't go back to that place where I died and do you know balloons and all that. I died. What if you died there. in a bed. My spirit's not there. Yeah. Mm-mm. How do you die? On top of me. On top what you gonna do? You gonna put some teddy bears <laughs> on the bed? On the bed. Don't do that. How, how does that go? I, I just, I don't think that's cool. And, you know, no, no. I mean, get insurance. We used to have an insurance guy, Mr. Conway. i would never forget. This guy used to come to our house to come. I remember the insurance. insurance people used to come. Yeah. I remember, I remember that. I remember. Mm-hmm. What's that, year? No, no. I said, I remember too, a long time ago. Um, This is before going back to what I was saying about insurance and stuff. Someone used to come to our house too, you know, yeah. like. 
Yeah. Make sure you know that you got insurance. Mom, I'm like, don't pay them people. Come up here. We we got insurance for y'all. But yeah, they used to come. I come remember the that. House. That's a lot of people back then that had it, though. Because if yeah. you think a lot of people our age and, and Jared Jared's age, just growing up, remembering that that insurance person used to come to the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I'm like, wow, mm-hmm. thinking back, that's that's a lot of people that had it. And I wonder, why did that stop? Yeah, well. People didn't want to come up in people's houses anymore. That, yeah. Um, yeah. Like, no, I'm not coming here. You can go on the computer and do it, you know, but um, back at, back in the day when the insurance people used to come to the house, you know, you were home. They didn't have to hunt you down for that $13. <laughs> you know, you know, it's going to be there, you know, yeah. and, and with all the policies they have now, you back in the day, they just had insurance for your death. They didn't mm-hmm. have anything for your burial plot. I mean, that's this is a whole thing. This is a whole business. You mm-hmm. gotta have a plot too. You got somebody gotta dig something up for your behind to go in. Mm-hmm. You know, so just take care of business. I am not passing a hat and I'm not one contributing to the hat. Mm-hmm. You know, don't ask me. I ain't got it. I'm uh-uh. Sorry. I don't got with it. people to be turned up me. like every week they turned up they got new outfits everything but when they died talking about y'all got five dollars what yeah, yeah. I, got, no. I, I don't All got right. it you right All i ain't right. even Let's making a on. potato salad for the repast i ain't doing it you ain't gonna make no potato salad no Keegan, you ain't gonna make no potato salad. you ain't even gonna make no potato salad not even a little bit damn, <laughs> damn. that's cold <laughs> that's cool that's cold, Joe. I mean, like, Kiki didn't went to glory. She ain't got no insurance. No potato salad. <laughs> <laughs> no potato salad for her. I ain't even going to, then that's all right, because I ain't going to die then. Nope, no, no, I ain't going to die. I ain't going to die. Okay. I ain't going to die. That's the hat. Right. You know what? You know what might die? Nicki Minaj and her husband's marriage. It might be done by the end of the year. Uh, we're going to switch gears and talk about this drama. So I believe the woman's name is Jennifer Hough, H-O-U-G-H. She is the alleged rape victim of Nicki Minaj's husband, Kenneth Petty, and she shared key details, according to the Jasmine brand, surrounding her lawsuit against the couple in an exclusive interview on The Real. Jer, Jer, you saw it. There were clips all over social media, and they even extended the conversation about sexual assault and rape. So according yeah. to Hoff, Nicki Minaj and Mr. Petty have been harassing her to recant her claims that he raped her when they were teenagers. She says that... Um, that the alleged intimidation that she's been receiving from the couple started after he was arrested in California for failing Mm -hmm. to register as a sex offender. And then the ladies um, uh, of the real, uh, well, I guess, you know, she was talking to the ladies and so she became emotional and she explained everything that she had gone through because she refuses to shy away from her truth when asked why she publicly, why she's coming public now she says i'm tired of being afraid so and you know i'm I'm just jumping through lines here she says so the only way not to be afraid is to continue to speak up i commend her because a lot of accusers don't um they don't come forward and so uh you know it's kind of hard for you to believe them when they don't come forward and you think oh they just want money and i've been that person i've been that judgmental right. person like oh they just want money there has to be you know um something but for you to come out in in front of a camera in front of an audience and put your like i don't care knowing that you've been harassed knowing that you've been threatened and you're like i don't care this is my truth if something happens to me you know who did it mm-hmm. you know exactly um, so you know, uh, Jerry, you said you watched the interview. Yeah, so I had, um, you know, it was on the shade room. Like, they showed clips of it. Mm-hmm. And um, at work today, I was able to watch the full interview with her on there. And it was sad. You know, it, mm-hmm. I, it was, you could tell, like, she's still hurting. And, you know, she tried to move past it, of course. But when he got arrested, it brought things back up. Um, and... You know, I hate the victim shaming, you know, mm. I, that's what I don't like. And this is why women are scared to come forward. We see it all the time, you know, with R. Kelly's uh, case being the biggest one, you know, the minute mm. 
his victims were coming out, things were happening, you know what I mean? Like threats and, um, you know, didn't the one girl's car get caught on fire, stuff like that. And I remember in the interview, she was saying she had to move multiple times and was scared for her children, you know? That's a tough situation, you know, to be in. And um, I didn't know that they offered her money to recant her story. That was new to me. And I'm like, what? You know, and she didn't take the money, which I bought her, um, you know, wow. definitely you should not like, take the money in. Um, you're not going to pay me for- not going to shut me up. Shut me up, you know what I mean? That's, mm-hmm. that's cool. Um, so I just hope that, um, you know, she finds peace within the situation and, um, you know, it just, I just hope that's going to cost Nicki Minaj. He don't have no money. Yeah. That's because, yeah, it's because of when you start dipping in her coin purse, Mm. (laughs) that's it. That that you got chatted chick. I got my juice box. Obviously you got a sippy cup there. Is that a sippy cup? Yeah, look just like a sippy cup, dude. <laughs> but anyway, with, with, with this, I mean, how long have these allegations been going on and Nikki's still been with and him? Since they announced that they were together because when right. she started dating him, because they went to high school together, mm-hmm. I think, yep. and they, they rekindled or something, relationship or whatever. And mm-hmm. he's been getting, because he was in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, and as soon as he got out, like, it was like, mm. You know, he like touching folk and like, what? And she didn't mm-hmm. care. And I mean, if you want to save your, I don't want to. My point exactly, she didn't care. And she doesn't. So right. wait till them coins, wait till she start having no. to pay legal no. fees and you're going to be like, you know what? You knew this, you knew this was coming from the beginning when you got with him and, yeah. and all these things were against him. Or she could possibly think that he is innocent and maybe he could be i don't know but um, didn't he have a guilty plea or no no i'm yeah. sorry that was for if he okay never mind that was something different it's for because he didn't register as a sex offender he pled guilty uh to doing that okay back then he okay never mind wrong thing oh ma'am so, you're gonna have to do know. something with your man that's it's a little mm. raggedy. You got to take care of your son now. So mm. think of mm. your coins, Nicki Minaj. You Nikki, know what? Her son, she got a kid? Mm-hmm. Oh, you I ain't know. Know. I haven't talked to her in a long time. I can't. Yeah. So speaking of coins, <laughs> let's keep it moving. Karen Civil, do you know who that is? That, that'll be a no. If you got to know. <laughs> She's actually a marketing guru. She's like, Big, clearly not successful. If Lashawn don't know who she is, I know. I know. Oh, sorry, <laughs> marketing maven uh, from marketing, the baller, and I don't. She's know. a marketing maven, and this is according to the Baller Alert. She has been trending on social media over the past few days, being accused of taking advantage of former clients Jesse Wu, Joyner Lucas, um, and she's even been accused of and admitted to hiring a hacker to take down Hollywood Unlocks Instagram page. Uh, now another accuser has come forward alleging that Civil scammed Haitian nonprofit organization so a seed. Um, I don't follow her career. Our friend of the show, uh, Portia Fox, is a big fan of hers, and she talked about it earlier on her on her radio show. But Jerry, Jerry, you're familiar with the story, so what can you share? Yeah. So um, again, uh, I'm a fan of Joyner Lucas. He's a rapper, and it ain't came up on his page. And uh, <laughs> he's 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 a good rapper, but yeah. he had posted past um screenshots and text messages and all all this information oh, he had receipts he had receipts and this was from when he first came out years ago this is from like 2016 or whatever and um you know of him getting scammed out of like sixty thousand dollars and mm-hmm. he was saying you know i'm i gave you all my money that's all i had like i started from the bottom i had nothing and i worked hard for this money to get to you so you can help me with my brand and you know all this other stuff and it was they was going back and forth and he even had um screenshots of i guess her people saying making up something so that he can um tweet it you know what i mean saying like oh what i said wasn't 
you know, was false. Karen didn't do this and that. He's like, no, I'm not doing that stuff. So she came back and said something, you know, she had like an excuse. I can't remember exactly what it was. But after he came out, then that's when the Jesse Wu girl uh, had came out and said something. And Meek Mill had even said something um, too about her I don't think it was a scam, but it was something in that area. Um, and back in the day, Cameron had said the same thing about her scamming him out of some money. So uh, y'all don't realize this is part of that package. This is called the platinum package. The yeah. platinum <laughs> package is that you send me the money and then I make up a scandal. You know, I take your money and you get mm-hmm. mad about it. And then you tweet about it and you get popular from that. So that's the package. That's a mm. part of the package. That's marketing. Smart. Mm. That's what it looks mm. like, but she mm. ain't that's doing stuff. And, and this a- is why people don't invest in these. Uh, I, I watch, I see on social media all the time, you know, these social media marketers or social media managers. And they're like, we can increase your followers. We can do this, but you only have like 300 followers or you have a hundred and such and such followers. Um, and so watch that, watch, you know, what you, what you th- doing things organically is okay. You just have to be right. patient. You just yeah. have to be patient um, and just keep everything consistent. And, you know, I, I don't know who Karen Sybil is and hopefully, you know, she's a marketing person. She'll know what to do mm. to get out of it. LaShawn, coming from a marketing person, what do you yeah. think? I'm yeah. sorry, I'm a marketing person as well. With, with yeah. Oh, yeah, you too. <laughs> but you, but you, but you gave more... your piece. You gave your piece. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to be, know okay. that. Yeah. I'm gonna be over here. So that's what she said. You, yeah, drink your sippy cup. So, I mean, I, I, <laughs> um, like, I like, I'm a marketing person, but I'm not a social media person, so I don't have that would be a me. lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, so Kiki's all social media. I can, I can tell you how it should look and things like that and yeah social media is a big thing and I go for it but it seems like I don't know it depends on her clientele list if she really did something wrong like she is a big clientele list and some people get angry like they got the platinum dating package but they didn't get the right date that they thought they were going to get with that package so then they get mad like she didn't look like what I wanted he didn't look like what I wanted so then people get mad so it depends on how long her clientele list is, if she did something wrong. Because I just Googled her and she's worth millions and she's been out for a while. Because people were giving her money. That's why she's worth millions. She's yeah, been yeah. Scamming. So she had, she had the Ponzi scheme. <laughs> she had the Ponzi scheme now. But that's the hard thing about marketing because some people, like if they get big hits, they're, they're like thinking you're wonderful. And then, but there's a, there's a time limit to marketing. Like after a while you get this package, then I stopped doing the marketing for you. You know, mm-hmm. you got to boost yourself. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, and it keeps going like this, don't talk stuff on me. Cause you didn't work the plan, right. you know, cause uh, people get really upset about that. Like, I thought that I was going to do this. I take what you give me, try to make it bigger. But if you don't have a whole lot to put into it, I, I'm fixing it up. And you, you know? got to work too. It can't just be, work. it can't just be me. You know what I'm right. saying? We all got to work together. Um, Everything that I'm doing is to my audience and your audience, but also your audience, you know, you have to, you got to work too. It's, it's your mm-hmm. investment. This is your time. This is your brand. You don't just say here and then walk away. Like you still right. have to be invested. You got to know, you got to do your research too. You can't, you can't just, assume that because they have a popular name that, you know, even with me, you know, I I don't have a popular name, but people, you know, that I have a social media management company. So what you do is you go to my clients and you say, Hey, what's it like working with Kiki? So are you good with working? Like, is she trustworthy? Is it like, is it worth the money? Is it good? You know what I'm saying? And and then that's how you go off of it. Not just off of somebody's name. So yeah, well, she'd be your homework. She'd be all right. So um, we're waiting for Dr. Angelica Perez Johnston, who's going to join us today. And she is the Chief Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Officer for CCAC. She's also my soror. Um, We're going to talk about what she does and why she's the first Hispanic woman to take that position. Um, Like she's a Hispanic woman who passes for white. She'll tell you that. Um, And why she's in that position talking about diversity so yeah like she's she's Hispanic, super deep she passes for, she passes for. listen this is imitation in life uh, listen and she's checking in now but we're before she before right. we we talk to angelica is she going hey All sis right. 
<laughs> hey, sis. We are live Hi. on Facebook before you curse. It <laughs> we are live on Facebook and it, and you're it's Angelica, correct? Yeah. See? <laughs> Angelica. Okay. Or Dr. APJ, whichever one. Or Dr. APJ. So, oh, so um, the H is silent. I mean, the G is silent. The G is an H. Yes. Angelica. All right. Oh. So before we talk to Angelica, we're gonna go through uh, who the F cares news. So you are in here, perfect timing. All right, this is basically top stories, hot topics, the people, news stories that people are just like, so who cares? And just figure we just give the last five minutes to this. Birdman reveals who he thinks can beat Lil Wayne in a versus battle. He says that he wouldn't mind doing versus with Wheezy. So if anybody can go up against Wheezy, it would be Birdman. Nah, next. <laughs> Aren't they family? No, not anymore. Not after he kissed him in the mouth. I mean, full mouth kiss. Full mouth. Full blown. Yeah, you know, we all cool and all that, but I ain't, when I ain't going yeah, never no. do. Yeah, Unless no, it's bro. mouth to That's mouth. No it's put my lips on yours. It has no. to be, you got to be down. I got to be blowing that in there, but I'm not, I'm not full mouthing y'all. I'm just not. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And we're no. not going to have this on verses. Like, who cares? Yeah, uh, right. That's why I made Who the F Cares News. You know what else? Have. You know what else qualify for Who the F Cares News? The Migos' fashion has been memorialized at the Grammy Museum. Wow. Why was this news? I don't. I don't know. Maybe it's us. But Jerry's the millennial, so she don't even care. <laughs> what? What is the Migos' fashion? What, what, what are they doing? Differently? It's jeans and t-shirts, right. like. <laughs> How many people have been doing that at the Grammys? Wait, what? At the right. music places. Yeah, Leather pants, some, some J's, and a t-shirt. With a belt, you know. With a belt. Right. No, maybe. Yeah, belt, but your pants hanging up. Anyway. Or sagging. Right. Belt and sagging. Right. Oxymoron. Oxymoron right there. They are oxymorons. Um, yeah. Kim K has yeah. been uh, announced that she will... Uh, she will host SNL this season, and Deborah Messing from Will and Grace is pissed oh, off. Grace. She is a Peter and a Paul and a Paul. I guess she wanted to do it. Okay, <laughs> Kim Kardashian, Deborah Messing. Um, I don't know. I used to love Will and Grace. I thought that Grace was funny and Jack and all. I don't see anything funny about Kim Kardashian. I mean, I think if she goes on SNL, they're going to make more fun of her. Yeah. And, and guess she's what? Be funny. And guess what? And they'll be chiching. Chi -ching, and that's what she's. That's what she's doing. So yeah, like yeah. That, it's a good look for that. SNL because she has billions of followers. Right. Mm. Who cares if she's funny? People are going to watch. Nobody cares. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's going to be the Saturday I go to bed early. <laughs> you already go to bed early. All right. Um, here's two more things. Two more things. Steve Harvey says that his daughter, and you know, I don't really care. His daughter, Lori Harvey, is. this is the first time that she's been happy. So what? Yay. I'm happy. I love Lori Harvey. She's my hero. <laughs> I love her. Kiki can't stand her. I Kiki, you're such a hater. You don't like, you, this is why you don't like Lori. Because she's dated multiple. You've been calling Lori Harvey and telling her that I'm hating on her. And that's why she's yes. been with Michael B. Jordan longer. Because you've been telling her that I don't like her. her. And she's like, we're going to prove Kiki wrong. Mm -mm. I love her because she dates multiple people because she's dating. So that's what you do. You got to figure out which one you like. Don't she hasn't settled. I love her because she doesn't settle. So yeah. now she found someone that she really like, which is Michael B. Jordan, who happens mm. to be one of the finest guys. I find she, myself happy. swiping past him. If there's ever, I, I'm going. What? All right, last have? one. Hater last eggs one. I and can't, bacon. I can't. <laughs> hater up. eggs and bacon for breakfast, Kiki. With cheese, with <laughs> cheese, with and cheese. potatoes, eggs and bacon, and potatoes, and Not potatoes. A cup of I know. So <laughs> here's one I think you guys will laugh. I, Angelica has been laughing all the time, this whole time. R. Kelly has declined to take the stand at a sex trafficking trial. <laughs> Sorry, I almost what you going to say? Y'all trying to kill me. <laughs> uh, Robert, 
Robert. Um. Oh no. Don't try to kill me. <laughs> so he declared guilty. Just, just go. We just don't have to take the stand. You don't have to take the stand of video. What are you gonna say? Like, what could you? That ain't me. Where were you shooting? Sure? <laughs> what me? Where me? No, actually, that's not me. I don't know. That's Who not that me. Means. I don't know whose butt cheek that is. It's not me. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it wasn't me. Do your time in jail. Do you know right. brain? He's already do done it. Brain? Like, time served, basically. He's been in it for That's like 10 brain. years. Go all the way back like this. I don't know. All right. So that was who the who the F cares news. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. We have Dr. Angelica Perez Johnston here with us. She is the new chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer for CCAC. We met um and she just blew me away just in our lunch conversation. I was like, damn. Let me tell you something before we go to break. So we're talking, and Helica, I, I swear, she is the most confident person I know. We are in the sandwich shop, and there's nothing but Caucasian men up in here. She was like, you know, the problem with white people. I was like, mm. ooh, ooh, like ooh. She's like, let me tell you and another thing. And, I was like, and something else, right? right? Okay. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm embellishing a little bit, but let me tell you no, something. No, that's, that's pretty accurate. Uh, okay. It's, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about what she does and um and why she does what she does and then we're going to talk about um the hot topic about the haitian migrants and then these trending hashtags and, and what she thinks about them and and how we should you know how we should address them as as a community and um are we ever going to go back to uh black wall street is it too late for us to do that so we'll talk about that and why black folks still scared of the COVID vaccine we're going to take a quick break this is the hey girl hey podcast on urban media today hold tight count to five hey girl hey, hey. hey. all right it's the hey girl hey podcast urban media today um so we are live on facebook and we have a special guest this week um she is my so sweet soror z5 uh Dr. Angelica Perez Johnston. Do not call her Angela. Do not call her Angelica. <laughs> no, no, please don't. Don't call her Angel. Don't call her Angie. Please don't. don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. She will come for you. Don't do it. So, um, and she's the new chief diversity and equi chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer here in Pittsburgh at CCAC. And she has a, a, a trail of accomplishments, education, professional, and all of that. And I met her through a mutual friend. Shout outs to Monica Malik. Um, um, love me some Monica. <laughs> and she said, tell my chica, I said, hey. So she said, hey. hey um, but she said, you have to have her on the podcast. And I was like, why? She was like, I'm just, just meet her one time. Just meet her one time. <laughs> and so we met and our conversation was just, I was blown away. Um, and then what I told Jerry this story, but we're sitting there talking and, and Helica goes, <gasps> and I was like, what? And she was like, and she grabbed my hand and saw my Z5B. And she was like, and she grabbed her keychain and like, like, we're sorrows, me and you must never put my key down. So it was like sisterhood from the gate. Um, but yeah, so ever since then, you know, we've been texting and, and uh, it's just been such an honor to know you. And why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do and what the hell is a chief diversity, equity, inclusion officer? And is it true that you're the first Hispanic woman that's held that position? Like, give me the backstory on that. Yeah, so Dr. APJ, um, I am the first chief diversity, equity and inclusion officer in the state of Pennsylvania, Western side um, that holds the senior level diversity position as a Chicana, Mexican-American. Um, and so I, big shoes to fill, right? Like, <laughs> huge, like no pressure, no, no pressure. Like, right. Um, and I didn't discover that until 
really later after I was hired. So I was hired in March to start in July. And I spent June, all of June, meeting with community partners and other institutions and other folks doing the work intentionally within the city. And every time I was in a meeting, I looked around and I'm, well, you know, look at, looked at all the squares on Zoom and was like, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so I asked the questions and actually it was confirmed by uh, the Pittsburgh Conference on Higher Education. I am the only the only Latinx individual in Western mm -hmm. Pennsylvania in the senior mm -hmm. diversity role, so. And what is that job? What is that? Like, what is what do you do? What is it not? <laughs> <laughs> what is okay. it not? So I think for everybody comes to this work in their own way. Um, for me, it really means, so let me just be, I, I'm gonna be real. So it means teaching the white people not to be racist. Mm -hmm. to recognize about white privilege and mm. systemic oppression and white supremacy and all of those big words that white people don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, that's my job, right? My job is to ensure that equitable practices are embedded in every facet of our community college, um, to ensure that students are first, that we're thinking about our most systemically marginalized students when we're having conversations about literally anything that goes on institutionally. Um, and so I have the privilege and honor of being the voice in the room for all of our marginalized communities that don't have a seat at the table, which is huge. Um, but also I have amazing leadership. Dr. Quentin Bullock is just like, he's a powerhouse and super amazing, empowering, super supportive, like anything I ever say or do. He's like, how do you feel about that? And I'm like, I feel pretty good. I told a white man about himself today. And he's like, all right, good point. <laughs> it's a really good space to be in. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's amazing to me that I would not have envisioned myself in this type of position ever. Right. And I'm here now. So I feel really good about it. I feel uh, very grateful to be in the position and, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done for the city. There's a lot of work to be done for the college. And I'm just really, I mean, I've only been here for nine weeks and I'm already kicking ass. So. Did yeah. you, what type of work did you do before this um, that kind of led up to what you're doing now? <laughs> yeah, so. Like, were you a police I, officer, a Navy SEAL, FBI <laughs> agent? All of it, all of it. Okay, okay, okay. gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> no, so I actually never wanted to be in higher education. I never knew this was a career path for anybody, really. Um, so I went back to school in my mid-20s. I got my associate's degree a year after high school from the Bradford School of Business in Pittsburgh. That's right, went. Yay! My mom went there back mom when it was there. on Seventh and Grand. Yay. Yeah, she went there. Like I went to Yay. business school. Where is it at, mom? March like, Medicals. March yeah. Medicals. <laughs> she said that she went there too. <laughs> okay. So I did that in the '90s. Yeah, like '98 and '98 to 2000. Mm -hmm. mm. And then. Mm. Uh, I got married to a horrible white man. <laughs> Listen, you know you hate yourself when the man you marry for fun reenacts civil wars and fights for the Confederate side. side. Uh, I, thought, I knew you were going to say Confederate side. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, was, okay. it was a low point in my life, right? But okay. anyway, so after a lot of travel, I came back to Pennsylvania. It's where my ex-husband's family is from Erie, Pennsylvania. And um, after about a year of deception, I realized that uh, the only way to get out of the situation that I was in was to get into higher education. So I got my bachelor's degree in psychology, quickly realized that you can do nothing with a bachelor's degree in psychology. <laughs> Yeah. So sad. So sad. <laughs> like you have to advance the group. Yeah. yeah. Can... Right. And like nobody tells you that, right? They're like, oh right? yeah, get your bachelor's degree in psychology. I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah. no, there's nothing. So I got my master's in mental health counseling. I was actually a drug and alcohol therapist. And I thought that that was going to be um, where I landed for the rest of my life. 
quickly found out that inpatient drug and alcohol therapy is a revolving door for folks and I could not emotionally handle that. So I decided to begin uh, work as a treatment team coordinator for George Jr. Republic, which is the juvenile detention center for Mm at-risk male youth. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it, it seems serendipitous that every point in my career, I've always worked with systemically marginalized populations. Right. So it's really doing the work before I even knew what the work was. Wow. It was yeah. setting you up. It was setting yeah. you up. Yeah. yeah. So I did that for a while. And then I uh, took a part-time position as a therapist at Clarion University, quickly found out <laughs> that... Co- <laughs> Undergrad! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes all right girl y'all happy where but. were you the funny <laughs> <therapist>? <laughs> yeah. so yeah so I went I was there and I quickly found out that college female trauma although is very traumatic to a college woman in the grand scheme of things cannot be compared to trauma of a young black male that has been in the streets and experiencing gun violence and gang activity. And so I got out of mental health. I'm like, I can't do this anymore because I can't mm-hmm. see the difference between. Um, and when you know you can't be empathic in multiple settings, it's time to go. So mm-hmm. I became a student success coach um, at Clarion. I did that for a while got scooped up by Teal College. I did academic advising and then I did the director of first year experience and transition programs um, where I supported systemically marginalized students in a summer bridge program. I created a whole summer bridge program. I got to recruit my own students. I increased retention of students of color by 26% in one year. Um, And so Allegheny College saw that and they were like, oh, we want you. So I went to Allegheny College, became the associate director for their multicultural center, moved up to the director position, and then mm, CCAC saw me and they were like, ooh, we want you. And I'm like, ooh, do I want to go back to Pittsburgh? Do mm. I? And am I ready for this, right? Like I've been in student-facing, student-centered positions for a really, really long time. Like, am I ready to get out of the student game, first of all? And am I ready to be like this cabinet level, can't wear jeans and t-shirts to work every day? Like, that was a big decision. That was probably the hardest decision was that I couldn't wear jeans and Mm. (laughs) t-shirts. That's a pretty hard one. That's the deal breaker right there. Right? (laughs) You Uh want me to mm. wear what to work out? And I don't, yeah, I get it. <laughs> so, so Angelica, before you came on, uh, Kiki, I, I, I don't know, I don't know if you teased because I said something about imitation of life. Um, um, so you you identified as white, or you identified? No, like, people pass. We talked about passing. Oh, white passing. Oh, okay. we talk, white passing. No, but yeah, you actually bring up a really good point. So. And I think it's important to the work that I do. So my father is Mexican. My mother is white. Mm We actually grew up in Knox, Pennsylvania. Jared knows where Knox is. It's right by Clary and it's the middle of nowhere. Uh, Yeah. 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 (laughs) She said it's the middle of nowhere. It is right. right nowhere. Mm Mm-hmm. Middle of nowhere. Um, And so my mom met my dad in San Antonio, Texas, brought him to Pennsylvania, thought it would be a really good idea to raise half brown children in an all white region. Um, And so my experiences were that my social and surroundings were telling me that being brown was bad. In third grade, my first direct experience with racism was we were doing geography and we got to pick the countries that we presented on. And I wanted to present on Mexico, obviously, because like we had artifacts from Mexico. We went to Mexico for vacations and holidays and all of this stuff. So in third grade, I got up in front of the classroom and I was like, you know, today I'm going to talk about Mexico. And my third grade teacher mocked me and didn't stop my classroom from mocking me. And so, I mean, it's white, right? Like this is white America. This is rural white America. And so that happened. And then my parents got divorced when I was 12. And so all of these different things in my life have told me that being brown is bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And understanding that I have a white mother And if you're 12 years old and someone tells you, well, being white is good. And you're like, oh, well, I look white. I I think I want to do that. Like I'm going to be white. And so I did, I passed as white for a number of years from the time I was 12 until probably around 19. Yeah. Um, I made the conscious decision, actually probably until about 20 because I married my very racist husband when I was 20. Um, And so 
you know, coming to terms with that, but then understanding my reason as to why, why am I getting into this work? Why am I so interested in this entire culture that was told that it was bad? You know, why is it that, you know, my white family disregarded the way that my dad was treated and dismissed him for the things that he experienced? Why is it that all of these people treat my dad differently just because he looks different and talks different? And so I started to ask questions about myself and who I was. And then I got really amazing mentors that were like, no, honey, <laughs> you're not just white. Like, can we have a conversation about this? I'm like, well, I mean, I look white. And they're like, yes, yeah, okay, but let's explore that. And so, you know, my whys got me to a point of realization in where biculturalism intersects, right? And so, Finding out my whys then led me to finding out whys of other marginalized communities and finding out the whys of other marginalized communities then really led me into a place where I could intentionally do this work. But then I can sit in the room with a bunch of white people and be like, so tell me about your white experience. And they're like, oh, this is the white diversity lady. We're gonna really like tell her the things that we wouldn't tell any other person. And so then, you know, by the time we get into the middle of the conversation, I'm like, okay, so my dad is Mexican. Then they're like, oh, oh, we, we really said that in front of, right? So it gives me opportunity to see things that other people of color tend not to see. But that also affords me opportunity to process that experience with a white person and be like, okay, so this is why these things are problematic, right? And this is why we need to think of things in different ways. And this is why we talk about white privilege. And this is why, like when I present and facilitate in conversations, my white passing privilege is the first thing that I acknowledge because I want other white folks in the room to realize that if I'm a woman of color and I can, I can acknowledge and accept what my white passing privilege affords me mm-hmm. in spaces and places, then you as a fully white person should not be like, this should not be an uncomfortable conversation, right? Like this should be an intentional conversation about like, okay, so what can I do? Understanding that I have white privilege, how can I then advocate for systemically marginalized people that don't have a voice in a lot of these spaces. Yeah. So you were right. <laughs> mm. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I think it's I think it's it's, it's unique. Um, I celebrate that. I mean, because people we're all mixed with something. Yeah. And but it's it's really unique. Like because you have you get to see both sides that you're mm-hmm. mixed with. Like I, I say I'm African American, but because that's what I see with my parents. But if I go, you know, deep into the roots, we're mixed with a little bit of everything else. A little bit of something, mm-hmm. yeah. You know, a little bit of something. So but you have the opportunity to see both sides. And you know, um, I know earlier we were talking about uh Mario Van Peoples who passed away, but he did this movie called The Watermelon Watermelon Man or something, where a white guy went to sleep and woke up. No, a black guy went to sleep and woke up white the next day. And and this is movie, like it's a black exploitation movie. That's what he's famous for. Mm-hmm. So when he died today, they really talked about that. So in that movie, he woke up and when he he had so many privileges, like he was like, oh, shit, you know, why would I go back to being black? You know, mm-hmm. like, but you you get you get to see like both sides of it. So I think that's a good position for you to either for to correct people who don't know, who think they they can open up to you and tell you their wrongs, and you have the opportunity to correct them. So, um, but I also want to be clear because then, you know, we get into these spaces where people are like, well, you know, she's a woman of color. She has white passing privilege. And so we can tell her these things, but then we can say, oh, I know how you feel. No, you don't know how I feel because I have lived in a world where I am too white for Mexican spaces and too Mexican for white spaces. And I have had to sit in conversations where someone calls me a white woman. I'm like, well, who are you calling white? And they're like, okay, but are you living that genuinely every day? So I've constantly been been questioned about my identity, right? And then on the flip side of that, when I'm talking about like experiences of my black colleagues and friends and people are like, oh, I know how they feel. You will not, I will not ever, not even you. I will not ever know 
the experience of my black sisters. I will not ever know the experience of a black woman living in the United States today. I will never have that experience. So I can't say, oh, I know how you feel. I might wanna understand. Can you give me a little more about that experience so that I can empathize with you so that I can collaborate and try to find ways that we can be more intentionally supportive. But I also wanna be clear that that's not ever gonna be my experience, right? Like that's mm. not ever going to be my lived experience. So I can't like, when people are like, oh my gosh, I know how you feel. And you don't, right? Like, and I'm not ever going to diminish that. So like when I have conversations, especially in the college setting, my big thing for this year, and I was sharing this with Kiki when we met, is that I want as a city, but also as a college to look beyond the dichotomous perceptions of diversity. In the city, we're very much, it's black or white. Yeah. It's male or female. It's all of these binaries, right? And it doesn't acknowledge that there's a large Latinx population. We have refugee and immigrant populations. We have the largest LGBT youth population that is homeless in the state of Pennsylvania. Like there is intersectionality everywhere around us. But when I say that, white people are like, oh, she's not going to talk about the black people all the time. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 don't get it twisted because we're still centering black voices because the black people of the United States are the most marginalized, right? And so we can't have a conversation about all of these other intersections. I'm not talking about the oppression Olympics. What I'm talking about is we have to center the voices of the most marginalized in order to be intentionally supportive of all of our marginalized communities. Right. So people are like, oh, dichotomy. Oh, she's not gonna talk. I'm like, no, 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 that's, <laughs> that's, that's not what's happening. Yeah. Not today. <laughs> all of it. Yeah. We, we, have, we have less than, less than 12 minutes uh, so I want to actually get into some of the um, the trending hashtags, the, the Haitian migrants, um, the Emmy so white that's been trending, missing white girl syndrome um, mm. has been trending. Of course, Black Lives Matter, um, the lack of trust for the COVID vaccine, inadequate education, so many issues that involve our community. Like, where are you with that? What's the conversation like? with you and your, 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 I don't know, your husband or your coworkers, like how do you address these things? How do you even look at these, these types of things? And then um, can we ever, as a people get back to a black wall street? You know, it's something you, you read about it in the books it was like, wow, it sounded like it was so nice until it didn't, until it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? How do you address these, these types of topics? Um, well, you didn't even work with students. This is like staff. So. <laughs> I mean, there was a time, there was a time, yeah. there was a time when I worked with students mm -hmm. and I miss those times very much. Um, so full disclosure, my new husband is also white, mm -hmm. actually extremely white. He is ginger, which means he's like the whitest of white. I don't think I could pick a whiter man if I really tried. Um, <laughs> You're like, mm, like mm, you, 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 come on. Hair? Okay. That's what we're going to go with. <laughs> Uh, so the conversations that, and I have a 15 year old son. So our conversations, although I'm in the city Monday through Friday, we still get together on the weekends and the conversations are very intentional in, you know, how, how does my husband's level of privilege impact these conversations? How can he carry on social justice issues and be a voice in the room? Mm -hmm. uh, my 15 year old grapples with being a quarter Mexican. So what does that mean for him, right? Do I identify as a person of color? Do I identify as a white man? Cause I'm mostly white. Um, and then to compound that, like, you know he goes to school in a rural region. And so when he talks about hashtags and social justice people look at him like he has a third eye. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what do you mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, you got it good. Why are you complaining? <laughs> you have no idea. Yeah. I, I have think, no idea. You know, when, it comes to, when it comes to like the Haitian issues right now, this is not anything new. I think, you know, it, it, when, when George Floyd was murdered over two summers ago, holy cow. When mm -hmm. George Floyd was murdered over two summers ago, you know, people were like, oh, racial awakening. And I'm like, yo, this is like the 20th black man that has been murdered in a matter of a couple months. Like, why are we all of a sudden making a big deal? Well, social media mm -hmm. now, like the presence yeah. of social media and hashtags, right? The hashtags are what really gets people's attention. And so things that were never in the forefront of anyone's thinking before are now central to their thinking because they follow hashtags. 
They mm-hmm. follow hashtag BLM. They put mm-hmm. the little black box on their Instagram. And so the conversation then becomes, what are you doing beyond the hashtag? How are right. you actually mobilizing and being intentional and supporting, right? Like the Haitian migration issue is not one that just happened overnight. This has been an issue for years and years and years from the Trump administration on, right? Like mm-hmm. Mexican Americans were being detained the minute they crossed the border. Yeah. Mexican women were having history hysterectomies done without permission like these are not issues that are new it's just like this is what we're clinging on to today and so it's it's about having more intentional conversations about the issues on an ongoing basis as opposed to today we're going to have this conversation because it's a hashtag mm, 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 mm. In, in, in reference to the haitian migration i had gone to haiti for i was there some years ago for about a couple of weeks I was in Haiti just before their big attack. And um, and now, I mean, Haitians have always been here in the United States. Right. So when I see those pictures, it's so disturbing it of is. a man on a horse. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, it looks like, you know, he's running from slavery. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the United like, States. A lot of the images on social media have compared that moment yeah. to the, 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 the lynching or not the lynching but the hunting of slaves and and stuff like that and so now it's like you see it and you and you still hear the conversations um you know in the comments that well they shouldn't be here well well they're they're humans we care more about a pit bull Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like a dog being left in a car and you know i love my dog but but America will, we will hunt you down if you treat it, if you mistreated a damn poodle. Yeah. But we have, we justify why it's okay to whip a grown human being who just wants a better life for his family because right. living in Haiti is dangerous yeah. for him. Mm-hmm. And so like he wants to come here to the land of the free. Mm-hmm. And so to, to come here to a place where he can find freedom and take care of his family but he's being hunted down. So not only did he come from one toxic environment, but now to another one. And those who just cannot relate, who aren't familiar, don't see the connection. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, he should be, you know, he shouldn't have done it this way. He shouldn't have, but yet yeah. we can't wait. We can't, you know, we doing fundraiser, you know, thousand dollar plate dinners to save the poodles and making car- cardboard straws to save the turtles. And I get it, save the turtles, I get it. But what about human lives? So how yeah. do you change the, you know, we, we only have five minutes so quickly, how do we change that? How do you change that conversation? What are you doing, Angelica, to talk to your staff and to teachers or educators, those who, you know, make those comments or feel that way and, and, and tell them like, no, that's not right. That's not cool. How do you get them to, to think differently? <sighs> So you can't have the conversation about immigration issues without acknowledging the the bigger conversation of white privilege and people not being able to accept their white privilege. Mm. And so yeah. for me right now, and systemic oppression, you know, like it, for me, while those topics are very important and I'm not disregarding them, I, I'm on a mission to educate our faculty, staff and students that identify as white Mm -hmm. on how their privilege interplays with all of these issues, right? Like how how can you be more cognizant of the harm that's being caused by systemic oppression by white people, right? And the only way to do that is to understand your position and privilege and how that privilege then can basically annihilate an entire people Mm -hmm. just because you want to continue to advantage from your position in white privilege, right? So before we can even have the conversation about how to be intentional of supporting systemically marginalized students, people need to recognize their identities and how they impact the work that needs to be done, right? So I would love to say, hey, we're gonna sit down and have a conversation about Haiti today, but we're not there yet. Like we're not at a point where we can have a conversation about how other people are being oppressed because you can't even understand how you are contributing to that oppression, right? right. And so that's a bigger conversation to have before we get into the intentional conversations about how we can be supportive. Wow, okay. And I wish we had more time. There's so much, I, I knew we were going to more time. That hour anyway. goes by. 
it hour goes by quickly. Uh, wrapping up uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. So sorry we didn't get a parade October on St. Patrick's Day. October 15th. You still got three weeks, man. We can do it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, um, Melanie was pissed off that there was a St. Patrick's Day parade during Hispanic Heritage Month. I was like, oop, she was hot. So oh, anyway, I know. I know. <laughs> she was hot. <laughs> If you, if, get if one you know Melanie, December, you know Melanie Malloy, <laughs> she threw a lot of F-bombs. She was pissed. All right. So, and Helica, how can we reach you? How can we get in touch with you and find you if, if we can, like, how can we find you if, if someone was watching and wanted to ask you some questions or whatever? Good luck finding me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty private in social media. Uh, LinkedIn. Okay. Dr. Mm -hmm. Angelica is the first name. So if you search me on LinkedIn, it's Dr. Angelica. Like that's, that's how you find me mm -hmm. um, on LinkedIn. You can always email me at a Perez hyphen Johnston at ccac.edu. Um, I'm more than willing to have the conversation. I also think that like going beyond the institutional walls. So this is part of my, my bigger concern is how do we educate our communities, right? Mm -hmm. So like we're a community college, which means we should be reaching far beyond our institutional walls. So, mm -hmm. you know, if there are folks that are interested in having community conversations or wanting community trainings, those are things that I'm very much interested in, in, in facilitating because I think it's important to the work that I do. So Love that. Thank you so much for being here, Soror. Appreciate you. Thank you, Soror. Yes. Um, this is the Hey Girl, Hey Podcast. I'm your radio chick, Kiki Brown. And I'm the chatter chick, LaShawn. And I'm your millennial chick, Jeer Jeer. Jeer Jeer. <laughs> so what are we going to give Angelica? What's her, what's her chick name? The inclusion chick. I want to say. <laughs> yeah. Equity and inclusion. inclusion chick. Okay. Equity inclusion. and inclusion chick. Okay. I like it. I like it. This is our fourth season. You should be able to get in touch with us now. You should be yeah. able to find us on social media. The Hey Girl Hey podcast. You, we're everywhere. Um, you can, we're everywhere. We're on SoundCloud. We're on um, what, Podbean. We're on, we're on Apple Podcasts. We're everywhere. So just find us. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jerry, what did your hair change? I mean, in the beginning, your hair was. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I Wait, did she change while, while Angelica was talking? Something I happened. I just happened to look. I was like, her hair wasn't like that. <laughs> All right, take the wheel, Jesus, and turn on the blinkers. Take the All wheel. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. It's the Hey Girl Hey podcast on Urban Media Thanks, today. Thanks, Angelica. Thank you.